Once in ancient India, not far from the town of Alavi, a weaver's daughter, a young woman of 16 years, she heard the Buddha speak. Well, she was returning from her father's workshop with a basket full of empty shuttles on her head. Tall and graceful, she balanced the basket easily as she threaded her way through the crowded streets, taking in all the sights and sounds, all the smells. When she reached the city gates, she stopped to watch a pair of acrobats performing backflips and somersaults. They had no fear. And then along came the king's drummer. He struck his drum. He called out the news of a festival, a festival. She looked up. There were her friends, two sisters who were daughters of a neighbor. They laughed and ran to greet her. Where are you going? She asked them. Haven't you heard, said the older one, the teacher has come, the one they call the Buddha. He has come to the shrine at Aglava. The king has built a great vihara for all the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Won't you come with us, said the younger one. Shyly, she slipped a hand into the hand of the weaver's daughter. Your work is done. Why not come with us? Happily, she agreed. Her father would not be home for many hours, and she could easily fill shuttles by lamplight. Well, the three girls made their way along a winding path that led from the city gates to the ancient shrine of Akalava, which stood in a grove of flowering trees. When they entered the hall, they saw a great crowd of people sitting quietly, and there, on a low platform, sat the teacher, the Buddha. Well, the weaver's daughter, she reached down her basket, she bowed, and she took a seat, one friend on either side. The Buddha was giving a teaching on mindfulness of death. Practice in this way, calling to mind these truths. Life is uncertain. Jiwitang aruvang. Death is certain. Marana duvang. Practice and cultivate mindfulness of death. Marana satim. Do not be like the man who at the end of his life is like one afraid of a poisonous snake who trembles and fear. He cries out and his time is done, Kalakatto. Rather, be like the man who at the end of his life has no fear. He takes hold of a stick as if seeing the snake from afar. He tosses the snake aside, Nasantasanti. Practice and develop mindfulness of death, Maranasatim. The weaver's daughter, where she sat in the hall. She heard the wind come up outside, sweeping through the long, hanging branches of the Udambara trees. She felt a tremor of delight pass through her entire being. She said to herself, the whole world, the whole world is quivering. The Buddha continued. He said, you must Call to mind these five recollections and let them serve you in practicing and developing mindfulness of death. Marana Satim. I am subject to aging. I have not gone beyond aging. This is the first recollection. I am subject to illness. I have not gone beyond illness. This is the second recollection. I am subject to death. I have not gone beyond death. This is the third recollection. 
all that is near and dear to me, from that I shall be separated. This is the fourth recollection. I am the owner of my actions, heir to my actions, whatever I do for good or ill, of that I shall be the heir. This is the fifth recollection. Call these to mind, morning, noon, and night, and let them serve you in developing mindfulness of death. Marana Satim. Well, when the Buddha had finished his teaching, the people bowed, they rose, they left the hall, stepping out under the towering trees, looking up at the darkening sky. But whatever impression that teaching had made upon their minds now drifted and scattered like petals in the wind. I am subject to aging, indeed. I am subject to illness, how true. But right now, the bathman, the bathman's apprentice, the conch blower, the chariot driver, the courtiers, the courtesans, they had business to attend to. They hurried ahead of the storm. But the weaver's daughter, when she lifted that basket and set it on her head, she made a firm resolve. This teaching is wonderful indeed. I shall practice and develop mindfulness of death. Her friends ran ahead of her, chasing after the falling blossoms and placing them in their hair. Well, at the end of the rainy season, the Buddha returned to Savati, to Jetavana Monastery. But in the town of Alavi, the weaver's daughter practiced and developed mindfulness of death. And she had a rhythm to her practice in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. And when the day broke, as she knelt to light the fire to prepare her father's tea, she would repeat, I am subject to aging. I have not gone beyond aging. Well, it was difficult to believe. She was only 16. But she had seen the women in the marketplace, their bodies bent from years of carrying loads. Still, time will claim me. I, too, am subject to aging. And when she dropped the fragrant leaves into the boiling water to make her father's tea, she would repeat, I am subject to illness. I have not gone beyond illness. And she would call to mind a memory of when she was a small girl and she had fallen ill with a fever. It had seemed to her that her body was on fire. She begged her father to lift her up and take her and drop her in the river and let her be carried away in the cool stream. But he only pressed damp cloths against her arms and limbs and she recovered. I am subject to illness. I have not gone beyond illness. And when she stirred the payasam and served the bowl of sweet rice porridge to her father. She remembered her mother and how her mother had added wild honey and crushed sugar and fresh ghee. How still her mother had lain when the fever claimed her. And the weaver's daughter, she had no strength to wail and lament. All she could do was watch as the neighbors came and washed her mother's body and wrapped her in yards of white linen and carried her away to the cremation grounds. I too am subject to death. I have not gone beyond death. And as she made her way through the streets of the city towards her father's workshop, she would repeat, 
all that is near and dear to me. From that, I shall be separated. And this world of sight and sound and movement, it was dear to her indeed. The sight of the elephants coming from the river with the droplets of water falling from their ears. The potters arranging their wares, the women in the market calling out their fruit and vegetables. The saris, blue and green, and the women, the noble women with their coal-rimmed eyes, leaving a scent of sandalwood as they went by. And the noblemen on horseback wearing garlands. This world was very dear to her indeed. And as was her father, who often in the evening would tell her stories of the village. And even though sometimes he would lift a hand to strike her in anger and frustration over a customer who had never paid, she forgave him and she recalled those moments when they stood together side by side and served the monks who came on alms round. And at night, when she lay down to sleep, she recalled each act of speech, each act of body, and even the movements of the mind. And she said to herself, all of my actions, each one of my actions, of these I am the heir. Whatever I do, for good or ill, of that, I shall truly be the heir. One day, when she was stopping at the city gates to smell the garlands and admire the bright colors, a troop of elephants, the king's elephants, came by, a great procession, and the last one in line with a sweep of his tail, he knocked over the garland seller's cart, and the garlands were scattered everywhere. Well, the weaver's daughter set down her basket and hurried to pick them up, shake them free of dust, and return them to the garland seller. Well, the garland seller, to thank her, he gave her one. It was a beautiful garland woven with peacock feathers and shells and bone amid the malika and jasmine. She wore it home, and arriving in the courtyard, she set it on the branch of a banyan tree. I am the owner of my actions. Whatever I do for good or ill, of that I shall be the heir. And so three years passed in this way, morning, noon, and night. The weaver's daughter practiced and developed mindfulness of death. And at the end of three years, one morning at daybreak, in Savati, the Buddha at dawn, surveying the world, saw that the weaver's daughter was ripe for awakening. He said to himself, I shall return to Alavi. The people will come. I shall give a teaching. The weaver's daughter will arrive. I shall pose four questions. And by her answers, she will clarify her understanding. It will be a great teaching for all those who are assembled. And so, in the company of all the monks and nuns, the Buddha set forth, ten days' journey on the dusty road, to Alavi and to the shrine at Agalava. Well, the news spread through the town that the teacher had returned. And the weaver's daughter heard the news. Her friends told her that the Buddha had returned. She asked her father, may I not go? May I not go and hear the teacher? You may go, but fill the shuttles. There is a cloak that is not yet finished and a customer is waiting. Fill the shuttles, bring the shuttles to the workshop, and then you may go. He set off, and the weaver's daughter sat down and carefully began to fill the shuttles, one after the other. 
And when the basket of shuttles was full, she set it on her head, and off she went through the crowded streets. But instead of making her way to her father's workshop, she found herself at once at the city gates, and then on the path to the shrine at Agalava. Meanwhile, the Buddha had received the meal offering, and he sat there, he sat there waiting, head downcast, his gaze lowered, and the people sat in silence, knowing that the Buddha would give the teaching when he was ready. And when the weaver's daughter entered and saw all the people gathered, all the monks, all the nuns, and the Buddha sitting with his eyes down, she wondered at the stillness and then the Buddha raised his gaze and saw her, and she saw the Buddha seeing her. Is the Buddha now waiting for me? Has the Buddha been waiting for me all this time? She set down her basket. Carefully she made her way through the people sitting there. She bowed low before the Buddha and took her seat. The Buddha addressed the weaver's daughter. He said, Maiden, Maiden, from where are you coming? Bhante, she said, I do not know. The people began to mutter. What, what is she saying? The Buddha made a gesture for the silence and asked the second question, Maiden, where are you going? Bhante, I do not know. The people by now were puzzled indeed. How dare this young woman speak to the fully awakened Buddha in such a way? They muttered, and again he raised a hand to silence them and posed the third question. Maiden, do you not know where you are going? Yes, Bonte, I do know. The Buddha smiled. He said, Maiden, do you know? I do not. Now the people <laughs> erupted into conversation this young woman speaks riddles to the Buddha. What is this? The Buddha silenced them a third time, and he said, Young woman, tell these people assembled here. Explain your answers. Bhante, when you asked me from where I am coming, you were asking me from what life am I born into this life? And this I do not know. And likewise, when you asked me, where am I going? You were asking me, to what birth, to what destination am I going when I die? And this I truly do not know. But when you asked the third question, and you said, do you not know? You were asking me, did I not know the truth of death? And Bonte, I do know the truth of death, for all living beings must die. But then, when you asked the fourth question, did I know? You were asking me, did I know the time, whether early or late, morning, noon, or night? And this I do not know. Sadhu, said the Buddha, Sadhu, well spoken indeed. And then he spoke this verse. Andabuto ayang loko, tanuketa vipasati, sakunto jala mutova, apo sagaya gachati. Blind is this world. Few are those who see the truth.
like the bird that sets itself free from the hunter's net, who will seek and win release. Well, on hearing these words of the Buddha, the weaver's daughter felt within her the arising of unshakable, unshakable faith in the Buddha, in the Dhamma, in the Sangha. And then, bowing low, she remembered the cloak that was not yet finished, the shuttles that her father was waiting for. She bowed again, and carefully she made her way through the crowd of people, collected her basket, and set out from the shrine at Agalava. But as she moved under the flowering trees, the world came to her with such vivid clarity. The blue of the sky, the white of the clouds, the sweeping movement, of the hanging branches, the falling blossoms. And at the city gates, there were her friends, the garland sellers. She bowed to them and quickly made her way through the city streets. And as she went, it came to her that there existed an underground stream that connected all living beings and the very earth itself. And now, she was not separate. She had entered that stream. She came at length to her father's workshop. She entered from the bright, bright sky, the brightness of the day, into the darkness and coolness of her father's workshop where he had fallen asleep, sitting on the bench before the loom, and not been able to see because of the brightness and the darkness she bent forward to give him the basket and it fell to the ground with a great clattering and instantly her father awoke and in a moment he recalled the cloak that was not yet finished, the customer that was waiting. He reached for the topmost beam of the loom, he pulled it forward and down and it struck his daughter on the breast and she fell to the ground, lifeless. Well, the weaver, seeing his daughter lying there, he began to weep as he bathed her blood away. And then he made his way through the streets of the city to the shrine at Agalava. And the Buddha bade him come forward the tears streaming. And the Buddha said, Weaver, Pesakara, you have already wept more tears over the death of your daughter than there is water in the four great oceans. Grieve, Weaver, but do not grieve forever. Well, after some time in sorrowing, that weaver entered the order of monks. And as for the weaver's daughter, after her death, she was reborn in one of the heaven realms. And there she was fortunate indeed to hear the teaching from the future Buddha, Metea. <laughs>